this national discussion in the National Town Hall Square on dis bringing talent to academic medicine. I'm Valerie Clark. I'm the Director of Faculty Development here at the AAMC, and I'm the Group Program Leader for the Group on Faculty Affairs. This project is based on the work of Dr. Henry Strobel and Dr. Tom Vigiano. The Faculty Life Cycle Series has five elements, recruitment, orientation, exploration, development, and transition. Today, we are going to talk about recruitment. I am going to be joined by the moderator for this series, Dr. Colin Stewart. Please help me welcome him with a virtual applause, Dr. Colin Stewart. Hey, Valerie, good to see you, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm Colin Stewart, and uh, I'm going to be the moderator for this session today. So I, I want us to start with uh, a framing question that we can all have in, in our minds as we get this discussion going. Um, so how many of you have a clear institutional or departmental strategy for encouraging residents to pursue academic medicine careers? Take a, a few seconds to, to think about that clear institutional or departmental strategy, right? Um, and part of the reason we want to think about this is because we've got some recent data that I want to draw you guys' attention to. Uh, if you look at some of uh, this analysis in brief from um, July of 2015 put out by the AMC, uh, it's got some really interesting data. So it compared data and sort of uh, integrated data from three different AMC surveys. And one of the most important pieces of data that, that sort of struck me was that the vast majority of people who identify themselves as potentially going into a career in academic medicine make that transition within the first five to 10 years after finishing their MD, MD degree. That means within that first few years after finishing residency. And so, you know, part of what we're thinking about today is how do we uh, bring people who are thinking about a career in academic medicine uh, into academic medicine uh, early on in their careers. Um, and so another question that I want you guys to have in mind before we hear from our next speaker is uh, whether residents typically receive guidance on how to market themselves and what they need to do in order to prepare for an academic job search. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Dr. Ashley Jaffe, um, who's going to talk to us about her journey into academic medicine. So Dr. Jaffe re received her BS in bioengineering at the University of California, San Diego, and her MD from the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine. She completed her internship in pediatrics at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, her residency training in physical medicine and rehabilitation, at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, and her Pediatric Rehabilitation Medicine Fellowship at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Jaffe, Dr. Jaffe is currently appointed as an Assistant Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, is an attending physician in the Division of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Jaffe to the discussion. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Colin, for that introduction. Um, so I'm really excited for this opportunity to talk to you about how I ended up in academic medicine, which was sort of an unplanned journey. So Colin just gave the overview of some of the places where I've trained, but here are some logos that go along with that just to kind of guide you through. So early on in medical school at, the, at UIC, I had found out that I had an affinity for committee work, and I realized that I would seek out opportunities for leadership, for leadership as well as any sort of student involvement. There was a mentor of mine who realized that I had this affinity for doing extracurriculars, and he helped guide me to some wonderful opportunities that really shaped my medical school career. Additionally, during the summer between first and second year of medical school, I did an externship at RIC, the Rehab Institute of Chicago, and there I found a clinical mentor who actually helped me figure out the specialty that I ultimately ended up in, pediatric rehabilitation medicine, but she also got me involved in what I would call traditional research. So I had the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial with a team of engineers. and. 
this was um, a great opportunity to sort of get this early exposure to research. However, I left that opportunity wondering if a career in academics was actually for me because I didn't see myself as having a PhD or you know, having a whole team of engineers that I could work with moving forward. So during internship, I was fortunate to be involved in the GME committee at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, and I found a mentor who was passionate about resident education who got me involved in revamping some of the educational initiatives going on for the pediatric residents. Subsequently, at Thomas Jefferson during residency, I met uh, Dr. Melvin, who you'll be hearing from shortly. And Dr. Melvin was instrumental in helping me realize that work that I was already doing would be important for um, things that could be published and started to change my ideas about what publishing and academia were. He was also the co-author of my first poster as well as my first peer-reviewed uh, newsletter publication. And I got involved in some hospital-wide patient safety work during that time. Then finally at Cincinnati Children's, um, I expressed my love of medical education and was uh, found a mentor who connected me with the Masters of Medical Education program there. So by pursuing this master's degree, it helped me realize that there was a place for scholarship around education and quality improvement for residents. Then now I have my uh, faculty appointment at Penn and I'm starting to, um, to get more involved with all the different research that's going on here. So some of the lessons I learned that I wanted to share with you that I thought would be useful. Um, my early exposure to the engineering-based research was exciting. However, I just didn't see myself doing it personally. However, it was Dr. Melvin, as I mentioned, that really helped me realize that what I was doing was publishable, and he really helped me reshape my idea of what a career in academics could look like beyond just cl clinical trials. So I've continued to try to find ways to publish things that I'm interested in doing. Um, and it's important as you're working with different students, although they may be interested in your personal research, keep them in mind or keep in mind that there are multiple ways that careers in academia um, can be shaped and people are doing research in all different sorts of areas from clinical to Ben's research, but also in other areas such as quality improvement and medical education. Also, a CV is essentially a narrative of your academic journey, and Dr. Melvin helped me realize this early on in my career. By putting everything down on paper that you're doing early in training, it really helps you build a roadmap of your career path, as well as think about every experience that, um, as a way to augment your skill set. It also helps me figure out where my strengths and weaknesses are very early in my career, and it's a good habit to get involved with keeping your CV up to date and keeping it started um, early in training. And finally, a couple more lessons. As you've heard me talk about, throughout my career I was fortunate to find mentors, um, many of whom I sought out on my own, but some of which really sought me out um, and found ways to go beyond just my general day-to-day -day interactions with them, whether on the wards or um, or anything else. Dr. Melvin is the, the chairman of our division and he really worked hard to connect with residents and foster mentorship relationships. So that really helped shape my career and helped me uh, go from fellowship directly into academics. Also, you want to find like-minded individuals. So it was really amazing when I connected with people who were interested and passionate about quality improvement as well as medical education. And finally, the most important lesson that I began learning in residency is learning how and when to say no. Um, as somebody who likes co uh, committee work and who really likes doing administrative things beyond my day-to-day -day patient work, it's really important to think about each opportunity. Um, and as Dr. Melvin would tell me, you can do all these things throughout your career, but you can't do them all at once. And as you get more and more, um, further and further along, each thing you say yes to ends up spiraling into often a bigger project than you realize. So it's important to pick and choose what you're being involved with and do this not just based on what opportunities are in front of you, but what you think will help shape and kind of continue to build that story that you've started on your CV. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story. and. Um, that's all. We're going to pass it over now to Dr. Melvin, or back to you, Colin. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Ashley. Um, that's a really, uh, really powerful story of going from not being sure what your interest is uh, into really launching, you know, headfirst into an academic career. 
it actually makes me think a little bit about uh, a way of understanding um, career development that I learned uh, through part of my time here at the AMC, which is thinking about having coaches in your career, mentors in your career, and sponsors in your career. And it sounds like we're about to talk to somebody, um, Dr. Melvin, who has served as a coach, a mentor, and a sponsor all in one for, for Ashley and, and her career. Um, so I'm doing a, uh, do a quick introduction of, of Dr. Melvin and then give you guys a, a framing question to think about before um, he talks with us about his journey. So Dr. Melvin has been a Michi professor and chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation um, uh, Medicine at Sydney Kimmel College of Medicine of Thomas Jefferson University since 1998. He was Vice President of Medical Affairs at Moss Rehab and Chairman of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Albert Einstein Medical Center of Philadelphia from 1991 to 2002. Dr. Melvin, as an academic physician, has actively contributed to the development of programs for individuals with physical disabilities for many, many years. He has done this through organizational leadership, advocacy, teaching, research, uh, and clinical services. Dr. Melvin has held many leadership positions in professional organizations dedicated to the improvement, development, and expansion of rehabilitation services. We're very pleased to have him here. So the, the framing question before we hear from Dr. Melvin is, do you think your resident graduates impact your institution's reputation when they're interviewing? With that in mind, I'll, I'll toss it over to Dr. Melvin. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the inv uh, invitation and the introduction. Uh, what I thought I would do is just briefly mention some of the things that we try to do to uh, help our residents achieve what their goals are. Uh, and actually, we do that for all our residents, but uh, these are relevant to the academic side. Um, Actually, in, during the orientation, I meet with all the new residents, and we go through a background of uh, where they've been, and then what their interests are, what their thoughts are, uh, whether they actually have any subspecialty interests at this time, or whether they're just trying to search for where to go, whether they have any idea about the type of practice setting they want to go, and, and whether that might be uh, academics. And at that time, I do a little bit of uh, describing the different models of uh, academics. Uh, for instance, the clinical teacher primarily, who is uh, mostly a clinician and has residents or students as teachers, or the more comprehensive medical school faculty roles of, uh, of teaching, uh, scholarly activity, clinical services, and uh, service to the institution. Uh, so. Um, as a result of that uh, discussion, uh, I try to get a, an idea about wh where they are and what their interests are. And if I find uh, an interest at that point, I try to arrange for that resident to have experiences with people that are uh, interested in and able to contribute to their development in the, those areas. But we also continue to monitor our residents as they go along to see whether they are ready for more uh, activity, particularly in the scholarly or uh, academic areas. Uh, I find and have found that residents vary a lot in the way that they can adjust to the clinical loads of residency. So some are ready very early, and some, even those who come in with a extensive research experience in PhDs, sometimes have to wait in the residency before they really get involved in more uh, activity. And, um, and again, it's when, when they're ready and when they've started to differentiate that uh, I try to arrange for them to meet with appropriate faculty, uh, not only in the department, but throughout the medical school or in some of the other schools, for instance, the School of Public Health. Uh, for, and the goal is to help them think about what their career is going to be and to give them uh, opportunities for scholarly activity. And again, a little bit as a... Ashley mentioned, uh, I've tried to bring to their attention that, again, there's a whole spectrum of things that fall under the uh, rubric of scholarly activity. Uh, there are research publications where the resident would be a collaborator and co-author. There are book chapters uh, for uh, uh, academics who are doing mostly uh, teaching and uh, clinical work, uh, but who are sh uh, writing up uh, 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 summaries of what they're doing. 
there are also peer-reviewed newsletters that are interested in the, some of the things that one would be doing. And in Ashley's case, her work with uh, uh, quality uh, and safety was uh, very interesting to the uh, newsletter. And also then pre uh, as co-authors of presentations and posters at both national and international meetings. I've involved a number of residents actually in international meetings with me. And then of course there's the uh, very uh, research intensive career path which would lead towards um, uh, NIH type of uh, research. And uh, we have uh, actually a relationship with the K-12 program, which is a sponsored um, mentored research program under the NIH. Uh, as far as the um, mentorship, why uh, we, I meet with residents and talk about career planning. Uh, they, they need to be specific for the specific resident. And uh, for those that are f focusing and moving towards an academic medical school type of career, it is important to uh, discuss a little bit career balance uh, and, and pointing out that this, these types of careers have multiple aspects, clinical, scholarly, teaching, service. Uh, but there is this uh, need for uh, scholarly activity, not necessarily only research, but other scholarly, but scholarly activity that needs to be early and consistent. Uh, then, uh, the, towards the end of the residency, uh, I meet almost with every resident uh, at, at their request, and, and we do discuss uh, the curriculum vitae. Uh, I have a very strong feeling that this is a window into the person and gives information about how uh, organized and what their activities are. Uh, I think the important elements of those curriculum vitae are that they're structured, concise, informative, complete in terms of giving all of the important things the person has done, but not over-aggrandizing. Then I also discuss with them uh, interview strategy, uh, things like that the interview is both you looking at the place and the place looking at you, and it's a back and forth. So I think that is the end of the uh, discussion that I had prepared. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Melvin uh, and Dr. Jaffe, for you know showing us the, the development across uh, the life cycle right, of, uh, of an academic career and how you know uh, an engaged uh, faculty member can form a relationship with you know um, somebody who's got an inkling that they might want to go into academic medicine and you know end up with uh, somebody like Ashley who's really you know taken that momentum and done such great things with it. Um, so now we're going to transition into our Q&A uh, section of our discussion. And so everybody should have on their screen um, uh, an explanation of how to pose questions to us um, so that we can then answer the questions and put them to our discussants here. So if you have questions, we really highly encourage you to type them in, send them to us, and then we'll do our best to triage those and get them to our discussants. So we have a couple questions already ready. Um, one question for this is, can go for either one of you guys. Um, how early in training should a resident start preparing for a career in academic medicine? Well, um, I, I might comment that because it follows up a little bit on uh, the comments I made earlier. It, it depends on the resident and their readiness, uh, a combination of what they've already done, uh, what they are in a position to be doing uh, very early uh, from the first day of the residency of some, uh, and um, moving on and how well they are able to handle the work of the uh, training program, which is the primary thing for them at that time, and when they're ready to be able to do extra things that represent uh, uh, working towards a scholarly uh, activity. Right, so it sounds like assessing readiness is a, you know, that requisite initial step. That's what I think, yes. I would also Absolutely. add that it's not 
Yeah, it's not too early to bring up the idea because, like I said, early exposure that I had during um, first in, first year uh, summer after medical school made me almost walk away from academics because my experience was a very traditional medical student research experience. And although it was wonderful, it really didn't jive with me as something that I was passionate enough about to pursue for my career. And so the sooner in my residency that I saw other models of academic um, physicians who were doing well um, made me sort of continue on that path towards academics. Right, and I think that's something that both of you guys have, have brought up that, you know, being connected with uh, people who are inspired by their work, and in particular inspired by the academic aspect of their work early on is important no matter, you know, where, what stage you are in terms of thinking about going into academics or not. So another question uh, that we've got for you guys, uh, what activities can residents participate in to attract candidates for junior faculty positions? That, uh, to be attractive candidates for junior faculty positions. So I think I was fortunate um, to have many different opportunities. It seemed to me along the way that there were constantly requests for resident representation across the board. So I had involvement with a double AMC. I had some involvement with my specialty society with resident representation positions. There was also hospital-wide committees that were looking for resident representatives. So in that sense, there's ways to get involved in different things early on. And then there's always faculty that are looking for residents to participate in publications. Um, I was able to co-author uh, something with a faculty member early in my training, as well as beginning to work on posters and such. So it's important just to think about when these opportunities come around to push them forward to your trainees, because you never know who may be thinking about, you know, who may be actually looking for something to get involved with. And then one opportunity, like I said, kind of can spark interest to start pursuing additional opportunities down the road. Well, I agree with Ashley's comments, but I would also add that uh, within our program, we, we arrange for residents to have uh, opportunity to uh, teach re uh, medical students, mm -hmm. and we also arrange for them to have, be able to be on committees that uh, are either academic or hospital-based that are similar to the kinds that they might run into later on as faculty members. Absolutely. I, I think it's, a, it's a wonderful point in just thinking about my own uh, path into academics. Uh, it wasn't something I was thinking about heading into to residency, but I found that I consistently really enjoyed teaching and then also got some positive mm -hmm. feedback about teaching, and then that sort of, you know, snowballed in a positive direction towards more of these opportunities that, that Ashley's talking about. Um, well, I'm excited. We've got a question from the, um, from the participant. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, do you approach mentorship differently for residents versus fellows? Well, my comment would be it's a little along the same theme that I made, which is that I, uh, I try to match the mentorship with the uh, person who's being mentored and, and where they are, what, the, what, what they're past, uh, what they bring to the table, and, uh, and then what they're ready for. So ordinarily, uh, a fellow would be a somewhat a more differentiated person and a somewhat more advanced person, so the mentorship for them would reflect, uh, again, their area of interest and, and uh, also their presumed ability to be more involved at a, a more advanced level. Um, I would just Ashley, add that... On the <laughs> Sorry, jump in the gun here, Colin. Um, I would just yeah. say that during fellowships, sometimes you have a little bit more time dedicated for research or for scholarly pursuits than you may have during residency. So it may be an opportunity, like for myself, pursuing a master's degree in medical education, um, or for other people really getting in depth with an area of interest or research, or taking some time away from clinical work to um, to do a sort of quality improvement sabbatical or rotation or something, whatever the institute allows. So you may be able to capitalize on that fellow's scholarly time during their training that's built in to really help them pursue and explore the depth of an area of interest, as opposed to residency, which I saw myself kind of getting a sampling and a taste as I was rotating around um, that just supplemented my clinical load, but wasn't necessarily replacing it for blocks of time. Absolutely. 
We've got another question from the group. Um, it says, I'm a mid-career uh, medical educator scientist who's been exposed to uh, bad mentors and have ha has seen poor personal support structures in place. Help, exclamation point. Um, what what uh, help or advice can you, uh, you guys offer for somebody who's um, in sort of the opposite situation, actually, that you found yourself in with, you know, an inspiring and, um, and engaged and active mentor in Dr. Melvin? Personally, I think um, the advice I received early on is that mentors don't come in the mentor, on the mentor form that's assigned to you, or, you know, they may not come in the places that you expect them. So a lot of times I sought out mentorship from people um, from my extracurricular activities or from beyond my department, um, whether I just went to a committee meeting, I went to a lecture I was interested in, and then approaching somebody after. And I don't know if you have to necessarily, I like to think of mentors, some are lifetime mentors, but some of them are more seasonal mentors, or like Colin referred to, um, some of them are more coaches or sponsors. So there may be moments where you have somebody who can help you get to that next step if you have a very focused question. And another way to look for it is, um, for example, there was a medical education scholarship research group that kind of met informally, uh, or met quarterly, just to kind of let everybody talk about their uh, their work that they were doing in medical education. And those may not have been assigned mentors or people I had known before, but I did reach out to some of them during my training to ask them for help during specific points in my project. So keep your eyes open maybe where you haven't been looking, and um, you'll find people are pretty willing to, to help give you advice, especially if it's for a specific focused question, and you have an ask for them of how they can help you get to the next step or coach you through this transition that you're going through. Um, or support you during a certain thing as opposed to looking for that one person you click with for the rest of your career because I think I, it's more about combining them all and all of their strengths to really supplement where you need assistance. Well, I, I would add that um, one, one, uh, one possibility, it may not be the case here, is actually, and I've done this a number of times, uh, arranged for uh, middle faculty to find mentors um, and rehabilitation or physical medicine rehabilitation is a small specialty, so sometimes it's very important to find people who are in other departments, or actually sometimes it's been people in other universities. And as far as um, the individual's concerned, uh, I think that uh, networking is a key element in the areas of their interest. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the networking, um, should uh, be uh, among people that you see as having similar interests and include not only people at the same level uh, but uh, maybe the leaders of the field. I've always found it very helpful to be involved with the uh, uh, professional associations and to attend the uh, social events where one uh, ends up being able to talk and start to establish uh, relationships. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I'm a child psychiatrist, and so I, I think sort of developmentally, and I work a lot with parents and, and kids, and we have this talk about this concept of goodness of fit between sort of the personality of and temperament of the kid and, and the parent. And it sounds like uh, both Dr. Jaffe and Dr. Melvin, you guys are getting at that in terms of, uh, you know, mentor-mentee relationships. And also it sounds like thinking about, especially for this person who had this question, you know, uh, is my personal sort of mission and values reflected in the mission and values of the institution that I'm in, right? If not, then you, it may be more difficult to find that kind of mentor or coach or sponsor that you're really looking for to help you make important decisions about your career or to advance your career. Um, that, it's just something that sort of popped into my mind. Well, just to add, uh, I have arranged uh, for a number of my faculty members to have mentors, and some of them are quite far around the country, but who match more exactly what they're after in terms of advancing their career. Absolutely, so casting a wide net and thinking you know, broadly, uh, especially like you said, and um, you know, I'm in child psychiatry, you guys are in PM&R, specialties where you know, the, the overall network is fairly small and that you get a lot of contact with these people during the year at conferences and meetings and through papers. And I'd We've like to... another question. 
Oh, yeah, I, I wanted to reemphasize one of Ashley's point, yeah. which is that I, I think it's uh, strong. It's it's good to remember that mentorship is for whatever the element of what one is trying to advance. So in the academic career, one does many different things. There are clinical areas and clinical specialty areas. There's teaching. Uh, there's area of scholarly activity or research. And so one may have more than one mentor, depending upon which of these elements uh, the mentor is best able to help them. That's right. That it's important to, uh, as, an, as a you know, person uh, working on uh, his or her own career development, to make sure that you have a variety of uh, mentors to help you in all these different areas of professional development. So we've got another question from the, the group. Uh, can you identify, this is a great question, can you identify common barriers to pursuing scholarly activity? I think the answer is yes. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> what, what are some of the common barriers that you all see to pursuing scholarly activity? Well, well, I think one of the biggest barriers is uh, unknowing about what it is to be involved in scholarly activity. And so I, I think it's important, and, and as the earlier that one can get the time to do this, the, the better, is to actually get involved, usually with somebody else, as a partner in terms of, of producing a scholarly product. And Ashley, what are your thoughts on, on barriers as, uh, you know, as a relatively recent trainee and then you know, now as an early career faculty member? Um, I think the one that probably resonates with most people is the time barrier. Um, and, you know, as you're transitioning to faculty, there's, you know, I'm taking extra time to see patients and do other, have other responsibilities. Um, one of my mentors personally told me to schedule in my scholarly activity on my calendar. So every week I have a little bit of administrative time, but what I actually do is I block out time. And if I, a meeting comes up or a patient um, need comes up, I reschedule that time with myself. So, you know, whether, I, whether, you know, some people do it first thing in the morning, at the end of your day, over the lunch hour, or you have some blocked off time that you can use, it's important to really make yourself make steady progress on that. Um, so find a way to commit, you know, 30 minutes a week or an hour a week just to moving forward that agenda. Um, and just keep, just keep abreast of everything that's going on that you may be able to, like Dr. Melvin said, to partner with other people. So you may be able to, to um, you know, to you have other people who are less busy than yourself who you can partner with, who can work on scholarly pursuits with you, whether it be trainees and helping mentor them as they're getting involved early in scholarly activity. Um, or, you know, other people in your division or your institution? Uh, one way I look at yeah. it is, uh, is the difference between operations and strategic activities. So, so much of what we do and uh, clinically and with our teaching loads are day-to-day -day operational with um, immediate uh, feedback. But to actually get a, a significant scholarly activity requires taking time off and and basically producing a strategic product. So uh, it, I think it's important to identify that that's a part of the elements that one wants to do and create the time to do it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, uh, Ash, uh, Dr. Jaffe and Dr. Melvin, a great tips. I am, you know, Ashley, or Dr. Ma uh, Jaffe, I'm going to write this one down about, um, <laughs> you know, scheduling specific time. I remember I had a, a chief resident who told me to schedule specific time to get my notes done and do my administrative work. But um, I need, you know, you need that time specifically. Uh, say this is only time for scholarly activity and you know nothing else. Um, another thing that uh, Dr. Jaffe was was pointing out that has been really helpful for me um, is finding that group of uh, accountable um, colleagues. And actually, a group of sort of early career child psychiatry fellowship uh, associate directors and training directors, you know, we got together and formed a, a scholarly, you know, paper and product accountability group. Now have done a couple of papers and posters, and um, so I think getting with like-minded colleagues who also want to produce uh, a scholarly product um, can be a really helpful strategy. Um, okay, we got another question. Uh, can you comment on whether you prefer a single mentor versus a mentoring team to help with your career uh, or, you know, on the other side of it, when you're uh, helping your residents or fellows? So single mentor versus mentoring team. Well, I, I think I kind of commented on my thoughts on that, which yeah. is that um, uh, 
I find there are times when I advise people to have more than one mentor because of their different activities. So that uh, it, it might be that in terms of the clinical setting, there's one person who's a mentor, whereas someone else would be either the research or the scholarly activity uh, mentor. So um, it, uh, I, I think it's, again, it's a little bit depends on the individual, but um, there are so many things that a faculty member does, uh, and not always uh, is that there are always somebody who has all of those elements that one personally is trying to develop. I would agree, Dr. Yeah, Melvin. Um, I was just thinking, you know, I I do best with a mentoring team, um, and this is both. Um, focused on the current time as well as longitudinal because it's important for me to, I continue to stay in touch with actually these mentors from medical school and residency. A lot of times I send them an email once or twice a year with an update of what I'm doing because you never know when that relationship and the history you have with them is going to be useful again. Um, I referred back to my old mentors that had an impact on me and I'm still sort of um, utilizing them at different points in time when I see them at a conference or, you know, sit down for coffee with them just to keep them abreast of what I'm doing because I appreciate their influence ongoing as well as adding new mentors to my repertoire as I'm moving forward um, from in transitioning from different institutions. Um, people will surprise you with how able they are to help you in small doses for a specific thing that you need mentorship with. So I find it extraordinarily helpful to um, to keep in touch long term with my team and to keep growing it um, to hopefully a bigger network, as well as um, widening the pipeline and trying to reach out to medical students and mentoring them for people who may want to go into our field. Um, we are a small specialty. People don't know what we do. So I you know, try to turn around and repay the favor as I'm receiving mentorship to also mentor um, you know, people who are looking for that, whether it's residents or medical students at this point, even early in my career. You always have something that you can offer somebody else. Um, and there's an area that you probably have expertise in that think about how you can turn that around um, and become a mentor yourself. I think it makes you a better mentee in the long run. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and to bring a couple of these ideas together, it sounds like both of y'all are saying that uh, from the faculty, from the mentor side, it's really, really important to get to know your mentee very well, right? So that consistently you can be bringing them as opportunities come up for, you know, uh, people who are going to help them develop a specific skill or people help them with career development decisions uh, and people who, connecting them with people who can get them where they want to go. Um, that you're constantly thinking about that and knowing your resident well and how she or he is evolving in terms of their career goals over time. And then, Dr. Jaffe, it sounds like you're saying that it's really important to consistently check in with yourself and reassess your own goals and, uh, uh, and sort of your own mission and then be searching for mentors uh, and coaches and sponsors who can help you develop those goals. Um, Okay, we've got a couple couple other questions. Uh, these are actually some of our uh, our questions for the um, for our discussant. Um, does it matter what the first faculty appointment is? Uh, isn't it better to get in the door than it is worrying about the details of the position? Good question. I'm not sure I completely understand it. Um, I think that uh, for one to be effective, one has to uh, be in an environment where they're doing what they want to do and and what yeah. gives them energy and uh, and and it gets their interest. So so I, I I don't think I would just get in the door and be doing something that I didn't want to do or uh, in an environment that uh, depressed me. I think I would. <laughs> Try to search for uh, a, a, a satisfying life. That's got a lot of good face value to that <laughs> approach, right? And, and Dr. Jaffe, your thoughts? Um, 
I mean, I think it's essential to to really find when you're interviewing around that place that's going to, like Dr. Melvison, that's going to nurture you and foster you to grow. So for me, the most important things looking for my first academic faculty appointment were um, the support of my division leader. Did he believe in some of the things that I was interested in pursuing? Um, looking for some protected time so that I knew I could continue to develop myself as I was early on in my scholarly career and have the time to do that and balance that with my patient care, um, my patient load, as well as have opportunities for administrative involvement early on. Um, so I think that finding yourself in a position where you can't nurture the things that are most important to you first thing in your career would really potentially be a setback. Um, also, if you if you sort of I think Colin you mentioned this earlier you know you have to kind of jive with the with the way the institution feels um, in order for things to really to make you feel like you want to get up and go to work and I think just like Dr Melvin said if you're happy you're going to be more productive and I think you know get more done than if you uh, get in something just to get in the door because you may find yourself in over your head doing things that you don't enjoy and. Um, it may be challenging then to continue to build your CV and develop yourself so that you are more marketable for that job that you really want. Um, so maybe take a look at uh, how you can <laughs> reshape that uh, to find somewhere that aligns with your personal goals and missions. And I might add that from a recruiting standpoint, we look for that, that we look for someone who um, matches the uh, style of our department, who is going to be a collaborator, where we have something for them to do that we see uh, will excite them. And um, so uh, actually from our side, we really wouldn't want somebody who was just looking and didn't have a, 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 something that made them really interested. Yeah, absolutely. And so it sounds like on, on both ends, um, being patient uh, while also actively pursuing um, you know, departments or or um, applicants to your department that uh, fit with you. You know, in terms of you know culture, style, um, and and goals and direction. Um, okay, so we got another uh, uh, question. This is a great specific question, uh, and this is probably a, a good one for Dr. Melvin. Uh, do you rely on the GME office to spearhead the initial mentorship? Or do you handle uh, them within individual departments or divisions? And then there's a second part to the question, uh, which is, are you identifying mentors prior to new residents or fellow orientation? Well, uh, we do it by department uh, here. Um, I, don't, I, I don't even think the GME office has a program of specific mentorship. I think they may encourage the departments to have uh, mentorship programs. And um, in terms of the way we start that program, as I told you, uh, at the orientation, I try to get an idea. And so there are some people that I'm already uh, earmarking as uh, being uh, ready for and needing mentorship that would move them in the right direction. Sometimes it's with me and sometimes it's with others. Uh, but we do have sort of a standard program of initially assigning mentors to all the residents which then are open for review and change as that resident changes and their needs change as they go through the program. Great, and, and Dr. Jaffe, any, any further thoughts? Um, no, I just know that my um, picking out my mentors has often fallen on my shoulders, so at my new institution it was asked of me after six months here to figure out who my mentor um, should be, and fortunately they did have a match process of sorts. It was uh, unofficial, but I sort of sent in some of my interests and they gave me a choice of a couple of different people. So I was, I had an initial meeting to see if we fit well, and fortunately, you know, it was a mutual process that we agreed that we would, you know, be a, a good match for our me a formal mentorship program. But, um, but otherwise, I think there, um, there's also, you know, plenty of opportunities, as I said, for informal mentoring and, you know, in all different aspects of your career. For sure, and, and I think uh, to piggyback on, on comments that both of you have already made, um, I think it just uh, emphasizes the importance uh, if you're a department chair or a training director or senior faculty member or even junior faculty member who's interested in mentorship, uh, just to work really hard from the get-go on getting to know your residents and your trainees uh, and their interests, you know, right from the beginning uh, so that they can be 
uh, formulating with you their career goals and their professional goals, and that you can sort of be actively pursuing in your mind, well, who would be the best fit for this person uh, in terms of helping them move towards those goals? Um, okay, so we've got a couple other questions. Um, yeah, how can institutions uh, ensure that their trainees make a good impression? And I'm, I'm guessing this question is like, make a good impression when they're interviewing in other places? Okay, right. When your trainees are interviewing for positions, you know, uh, you've trained them up and now they're going out into the world and interviewing in other places for faculty positions. Well, uh, I think from our perspective, the, the, the first step would be to try to uh, have the residents uh, putting together the experiences that will make them uh, valuable to where they interview early. That, uh, as soon as they're able to, we would like to see them get involved. Uh, as I said, we, we do involve almost all of our residents in uh, medical student teaching, uh, and uh, we do then have uh, encouragement for them to be on appropriate committees. And, and also then develop these mentorship relationships in the scholarly activity area. Uh, but also, as you, met, as you saw in our discussion, um, the curriculum vitae to me is a very important instrument in terms of uh, many of the things that Ashley described for the individual. But it's a, um, it is a presentation of the individual to those who are recruiting them. And it's the, one of the first things that the people who are recruiting see. So uh, I, I happen to have very strongly that it sh they should be developed uh, in a way that sends a good message uh, for the academic side. And then we, as I talked about earlier too, we, we talk a little bit about the interview process and uh, how one should approach that. And just to piggyback. Thoughts from somebody who, you know, recently had a successful interview process. Absolutely. I want to piggyback on Dr. Melvin's comments about the CV. Um, he, um, he takes it very seriously, but I think as a trainee coming out of his program, that was really one of the best things. I mean, he sat down with you and went through it with a fine-tooth comb and told you, you know, this experience maybe, you know, doesn't need to be on there. Why don't you highlight your, you know, your involvement with medical student teaching? Um, he, you know, would tell you this period's in the wrong spot. So, I mean, some of those things, though, really, when you're presenting yourself, it, it got you in the habit of being mes um, methodical about recording it. And I personally kept a, a live Google document um, that every time I did something, I just added it right in there. So it wasn't a big burden to put together a CV when I was asked for one. I simply printed it off. And, you know, every week I pretty much was jumping on that and making sure I just added and amended it. Um, so I really think that, that that tool was important. And what I found is as I was reviewing um, other people's CVs as part of a fellowship um, interview process as, you know, during my fellowship we were recruiting candidates. You can sort of, you, like Dr. Melvin said, you can tell a lot about um, individuals just based on their CV and how they're presenting themselves. Are they adding in experiences that maybe were, um, whether they were mandatory or they were not necessarily um, anything, you know, beyond what the average person did, or are they really presenting, or maybe they left off a lot of things that actually came out in the interview that would have been extraordinarily helpful. So just kind of making sure that there's a clear message as you present yourself, um, both on paper in the CV as well as um, at those early interviews, making sure that you're very clear with what your message is as you're going out um, of why you want to be doing what the, why you want to be interviewing there and, you know, how it's going to be a good fit for you. And that should all be consistent with what they read in your CV. And, and Dr. Jaffe, you really sort of crystallized something in my mind. I was trying to think strategically, well, what are these different ex experiences or exposures, mm -hmm. right? Like Dr. Melvin is saying, you know, going through that CV with a fine tooth comb, I just did that with my fellows last week. Um, and like you said, there's also this sort of uh, meta process that's going on that you're saying that when it comes to uh, putting forward your professional presentation, uh, that the details matter, right? Mm -hmm. Your process for going about it matters. Um, and keeping that live document updated, right? And so that you're ready to, to make it um, presentable in this nimble sort of way. Um, another thing that you're alluding to that I hadn't thought about in, the, uh, in this way until you mentioned it is that if you're a, a senior trainee and you get the opportunity to interview res or medical students who are coming into your residency program or applying for your residency program, 
or if you're a fellow and you're interviewing residents who are coming into applying for the fellowship program, then you have this opportunity to read CVs, look at personal statements, uh, and be on the other side of the interview process so that you're learning about what you like and what you don't like and what seems to land and what doesn't <laughs> land uh, through being on the other side of the interview and application process. Absolutely. Um, and keeping in mind, you know, some institutions have very strict guidelines for how you present yourself um, on your CV, but there's always, you know, ways to still add or subtract information even within any template that you're required to use. Absolutely, right. You can personalize it a little bit. Mm -hmm. My comment is I do, I do suggest that the residents use the Jefferson format, but, but it's not because I necessarily think it's the only format. Uh, I think it, uh, if, if a resident goes and presents their CV and the other person has a strong feeling about the way it ought to be, uh, and they can say, why did you do it this way? The resident can always say that they made me do it there, and uh, <laughs> that becomes a neutral response. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And I think also, right, I mean, you, it helps to, you know, developmentally it helps to start with more structure and then move to, you know, move to freelancing on your own, right? You start with a structure, you learn how to do it the right way, you know, the Jefferson way or the, you know, whichever way. And then, you know, later on in your career, you can adjust it as needed, as, as Dr. Jack was saying. So we got two more, time for two more questions. So first of the last two is, um, wait. Is this a question? This is not a question. Okay, this this okay, this is the last question. We don't have two more, we just have one more. Uh, so we've got uh, what can academic institutions do to make themselves more marketable and attractive to academic clinicians from outside of your area? That's a great question. Well, um, as I as a little bit along the lines of what I mentioned before, when we recruit, um, we basically have in mind uh, what we would like the person to do, and um, that includes a whole series of whatever educational activities, what uh, we would see as their scholarly requirements, uh, what kind of clinical areas and what kind of clinical sub-areas within the field. As it happens, since we're small, we usually are looking for someone that's relatively uh, a generalist but who is, has an interest to develop something uh, over time into a subspecialty area, and then they migrate into the subspecialty area and we get other generalists. So it, it, basically we put together a package that we think appeals to the uh, individual's um, professional desires and needs. And, 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 and then we also sell uh, our other faculty members to them because uh, we have, a, I think, a really great group who <laughs> who function together as a, a really integrated team. So we tend to emphasize those two things. Right, so that even if you're coming in from a, an area or a region of the country that's outside of this region, that if you feel like that the, the, the culture or the personal fit in this division or department is gonna feel, uh, you know, you're gonna feel connected to that, then it does, maybe these regional differences don't matter. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been our experience. Uh, after somebody spent a day of interviews with our people, they usually all think they're really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to add to that, you know, I think as someone who recently went through um, interviews on, along coming out of fellowship looking for my position, um, it's important that you give across a clear and consistent message to applicants as they're interviewing at your institution. It's unfortunate when one person tells um, tells the applicant that, you know, the, the division's doing great and there's no room for improvement, and then the next person in the next interview says, well, you know, we're kind of working on getting an office manager, and then the next person tells you about the nurse that they need, and, and suddenly, you know, they're building a case for um, there may be being issues. So it's important that everybody is on the same page. Um, it's okay if there's things, there's, you know, there's change going on in all of our institutions, but keeping in mind what message you're all getting across, so the applicant walks away thinking that everybody that they interviewed with gave them the same 
general gestalt and um, same type of information. Additionally, um, if somebody's moving from outside the area, my recommendation would be keep your communications with them prompt and keep them informed of the process. So sometimes it can drag on for months and if someone's making arrangements to potentially move to a new city, that requires all types of logistics for, you know, whether it's moving companies or other things. I think we forget when we get stuck in one place that, um, that those things are challenging and can take months to arrange, including privileges and getting new state licenses. Um, so the sooner, <coughs> excuse me, the sooner that you can keep the faculty member or potential candidate aware of your intention to offer them something or give them a letter or desire to hire um, and try to keep them, um, you know, give them dates as to when they're going to get some of that information back, you may sort of forget while you're sitting at your institution that um, their timeline is ticking and they may start looking for other opportunities if they haven't gotten the feedback that they need that things are moving forward from your position. That's a really important point, right, that you can communicate uh, early and clearly um, not just the clinical opportunities that this person will have or the scholarly opportunities that this person will have, but also, you know, the way that we do things here. How do we take care of you in all these other areas that are so important for, you know, both work-life balance and, and quality of life as a faculty member in general? I would just add that I think that keeping uh, the candidates up to date on how the process is going, because there's a lot of bureaucratic uh, steps that have to occur, uh, is important not just for people from out of town, but also <laughs> the dates. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Well, I, this has been an amazing discussion. We're going to bring uh, Valerie Clark back for some for some final comments before we before we wrap up. I just want to say thank you. Uh, please join me in in giving virtual applause to our panelists and moderator today. Thank you again. It was a tremendous discussion. Uh, the the uh, technology worked and we had wonderful participation. Um, please uh, do me a favor and uh, fill out the brief evaluation. We want to make sure that we get feedback and we can improve the installments in this series. And that reminds me that the next installment of this series is on March 8th at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, and we want you to join us for a, a national town hall discussion about the richer sex, uh, the growing number of women as breadwinners in academic medicine. Again, I thank you for this discussion, and I hope that you will have learned something that you can take away uh, to your own institution and that would help support and advance your own career. So again, thank you, and we're signing off from Washington, D.C. Dr. Stewart and myself, we say thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Bye. <laughs> mm -hmm.